Okay. <sighs> Volume seems to be okay. Um, hello, everyone. <sighs> Welcome to tonight's episode. Tonight's episode follows uh, an observation I have made recently that really fascinated me and I wondered why I hadn't noticed it earlier. The title of tonight's episode is We're Existing in Each Other's Memories and actually inside each other's memories. Now... I want to approach this with the significance and the certain momentum of kind of subjective approach I've kind of presented in these talks. And I want to say that I consider every moment of existence, every moment of human existence to have an objective component and a subjective component. Hence, there is an objective realm, there is a subjective realm, hence there is a subjective self and objective self. Do you see? And what the objective and subjection appear, subjective appear actually are different speeds of change in phenomena. One can say their thoughts change much quicker than their body, but their body too is changing. I mean, we, we get the illusion that our, our minds are running so quickly that we think our bodies are still. We think we are minds that have bodies. But it is honestly the various gradients uh, and various speeds that phenomenology is occurring at the same time in the same space. Now, the definition of space and time, of course, I'm going to get into that in a little bit. How I find that the more your attention becomes internalized, how that shifts in meaning. So let us consider that there is an objective self and a subjective self. The objective self, go look in the mirror, you'll see it. But the subjective self is a bit more fascinating than the objective self, that it is the one looking. It is the one looking and considering itself as the thought present in the moment. Some people have a relationship with their thoughts as if it's like certain people on their boat. Do you know? <laughs> certain images that they've accepted as, as what they see. But really, thoughts come and go. Chung Su, the Zen master, said it was like uh, beliefs are like leaves on a tree. As the seasons pass, so do they change. So what that means is not only man's objective environment is prone to change, but his inner environment changes. Now, I'm saying the inner environment changes much quicker than the outer. Now, to kind of explain this talk, now that I've kind of established the objective self and the subjective self, uh, I find this relationship that we are existing in each other's memories to be profound. And I thought about a sort of kind of a viewpoint that, all right, there's certain bonds that keep particles together, you know, atomic bonds. And so... I notice, okay, we have objective bonds, things that in some sense are, are the bridge in between objectivity, but in some sense I thought, what is a subjective bond? Do you know? And I wondered how interesting that as if I see person A is walking on the street and sees person B. Now, person B becomes a memory of person A. Let's say person A talks to person B. And now person B's reality has become an expression what does that mean that means it's as if like you are the background of many people's lives and many people's if their life was a movie uh we can say you are uh not the, the main character of their life for example lovers you can say those two lovers have become the main character of each other's lives you know but many people 
we are side characters or extras in their movie of life i i feel it i feel it's like this for everybody do you know <clears throat> and friendship is just recasting <laughs> you know and so what i'm trying to say is that the influence that man leaves behind that means in moments in my childhood i didn't realize but many people i would see based on my mind's preference, they would in some sense have some sort of archetypal value. I've even noticed this on a subtle level. When you get angry, you can really notice it. But in other states of mind, you can notice that moments are painted in other moments that we have lived. You see? That means one can experience a pattern that was very familiar to something that happened to them when they were young that suddenly evokes. That pattern just like lights up, you know? I'll tell you an example. When I was young, really young in Iran, it's one of my, you know, one of my early memories. Um, my grandfather's best friend was this extremely kind man that had some strange ability around nature. I'll never forget it. He was like, he was kind of like a druid. <laughs> But he was just this simple kind of, of course, he was, uh, it, it, my grandfather's friends were all uh, uh, Muslim, you know. And uh, of course, they were very religious and in, in certain religious spheres, at least even though the rationality, may, the skies of rationality may be clouded, but the skies of pure living is not. That means I have seen certain people that religion was a contentment, was the missing piece to all the questions that they felt their life was not meant for the answer, you know? That means they didn't have the time to look for the answer. Religion was kind of like a, a chair you can sit on. Or better yet, a kind of boat. Now... What I'm trying to say is that we exist in each other's memories and that's strange because right now I'll get back to the person A, person B kind of example I was saying, I'll finish that. But I'm just saying like, I was just thinking about it, how fascinating that some child or some person or, you know, some, any person, like 8 billion people, you know, as I've kind of walked going doing different errands in my life so many different people have seen me i was just thinking about it how many people have seen me on this planet you know and i wondered what was that tiny like imagine i remember i like my my family visited when i was very young we visited um what was it like italy and uh for example i wondered what would some random person who was like a local there in italy remember about me passing that street once do you know? And I noticed that we fill up each other's stories. And that's the unique advantage of 8 billion of us being here, that behind our eyes, those worlds, they're, they're soloing out the journey because from the savageness of man and animal, we're evolving into civility. But there will come a time where we man will realize it is only his attention to the... Uh, to the to the in inefficient first that denies the efficient i have seen some people and you you just see people's nature that's the cool thing you know we're not all like a bunch of clones you know there there is a uniqueness there is a difference every person not only has a different shape but in some sense they have a different sort of mind that has opened to the world you know and this has value, but the civilization doesn't see it. And so human beings have become gears for a machine that doesn't even see the human being. Do you know? That means um, the economical system is, will one day in the future be seen as a sort of kind of Egyptian slavery. But not now. Maybe in like 200 years, one, one guy is going to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> uh, 
Honestly, what I'm trying to say is that we, more than a person's communication can influence another person, what it is, is really we are, we start off as survivors cast away on our own islands and you have to use what is accessible. This is something I understood when I was young, not, not because of any ideological perspective I had, simply because there is an experience occurring. That means you your you can say that consciousness because it's asking the questions it is not seeing itself as the cause. If you saw yourself as the only person responsible for your life, then a lot of deep questions and mysteries will, in some sense, leave away, and that's not a bad thing. You see, man is either seeing himself as the source of his problems, or he's seeing himself as the source of his answers. There have been people I have spoken to, I have asked questions and they have given me answers. And I have spoken, I have asked people questions and they have just told me, look within. Like, how dare you ask before looking within? <laughs> and, and so really, I, I noticed that, of course, the species is attaining. And I, guys, there is a reason I'm speaking in a collective way, because honestly, like, sure. You can say a person has a unique nation, culture, feature, appearance, but honestly, honestly, we are heartbeats on a rock in the middle of nowhere. That's what it is. Simple heartbeats. We are moments where there is a strange synchronization of biological movement in receiving its environment as if think about the surface of this planet and nothing 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 eons going by nothing 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 suddenly something and then this tiny something began as an attempt and for a long time i was wondering what is influencing the psychology of man and believe it or not i dive deep into it and it's really one word light that all of human psychology is in the domain of visual sensory perception, which is another way of saying that light has become our world. We are solar powered psyches. And so that's crucial to note because really where what, what light reveals becomes our world. Light is like God saying creation exists. You know, like light entering man's eyes. That's what I mean. It's like an instantaneous origination of phenomena, uh, like an ontological quest, you know? The world became technological too fast and that made the linguistic technology of the human being not be fully adopted. What that means is back in the day there was less answers, less information. The information revolution hadn't occurred yet. The data revolution, no, all of this hadn't happened, you know? <clears throat> and so, because after industry, the information that directed the industry became more notable. So the world began becoming too much. Uh, like, how can I tell you? It's like more eyes on the planet, more stuff to see. So more stuff to see means more categorical expansions of, into the branches of knowledge. You know, and what, the reason they call knowledge like a tree, because it starts, it has one trunk. Do you see a tree is actually strangely like an infinity symbol. There is a strange symmetry in our universal sector. I feel whatever kind of flag for a global humanity we choose, it has to be symmetrical. Because we are creatures that are symmetrical, you know. So anyways, I was saying that in my, in my kind of inquiry of the psychology of the human being, I suddenly, constantly, it was as if I remember, it was like one night where... Um, not, like nothing was happening. It was a normal kind of day. But in that moment, I was, I was like sleepless. Have you ever had a question enter your mind that you can't sleep because of that question? Because of the mystery of what lies behind a certain vision, a certain pheno phenomena, uh, uh, pheno like a phenomenon. So <clears throat> I noticed something in that I was constantly wondering, all right, all right, let's, let's take it from a cosmological perspective let me just look at the universal sector let me see what's on like let's see if if earth the whole planet was a brain what kind of psychology does it have i, I wondered like this playfully and so to this depth at least and <clears throat> i noticed i noticed that 
the earth, our planet, is first of all spinning. It's like the planet is getting a full tan, full body tan. And just, I notice, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. This can even explain why are we, evolution designed a heartbeat. The constant on and off switch of light that kind of hit the earth, didn't hit, hit the earth, didn't hit, hit the earth, didn't hit. And what this did was it was a natural duality. Just the geometrical sort of movement of the planet influenced the psychology of the human being. And it influenced it to such a degree that ancient Egyptians saw the sun. They're like, oh my God, God is here. You know, and the sun went and they're like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then the moon came in, they're like, who's that guy? <laughs> and of course, guys, I'm being playful here because, um, of course... I'm being playful here, but what I'm saying really is that our psychology is incredibly influenced with dualism. And any person who in some sense becomes aware of duality, you have become aware of the shield and sword of your mind. Because language starts from a dualistic place. That means imagine me as a human being, I have no intention to give a talk, like one of these Mr. Within talks, okay? I'm just like, imagine going about my day, you know? <laughs> so I'm going about my day and then, it starts with one thought, suddenly, like an idea comes, I'm like, memory, you know, it's, it's like sometimes you don't know how many of these Mr. Within talks, it's kind of like the, the ignition of it or sometimes is, a, is an ambiguous emotion. So for example, I, the thought then arrives, for me, I have written so much on this earth, literally like my right hand has been in more battle than my left hand ever could tell stories about, you know? <laughs> so what I mean by that is that I've written a lot. And in writing, there's two kinds of writing. There's the writing that you were writing for others. To be honest, I understand it, but it is not the highest form of writing. The highest form of writing is not even freestyle writing. For me, the highest form of writing when your hand is synchronized with a sort of ability of the moment to witness a subjective living landscape. You see, the human being has one advantage. And that's free will. And really what free will is, is attention in the void somehow being able to, in accordance to certain data, to be a response. That means it's, it's too fascinating, first of all, of a cosmic structure. What that means is we should immediately create a global law and call it the law of su surprising knowledge. <laughs> and so what it is, is really that we are we will endlessly till the end of time constantly be fascinated and so hu the human mind i feel this is the kind of it's it's universal design guys there it's like all war is how can i say it reflections of the cosmic state there's one view, some, there's some people I've, I've seen in the, kinda, in the New Age community, they're like, oh no, the nuclear bombs that happened on Earth are setting the, a galactic audience a bad message. Do you know? As if like, we're not evolved up to their standards, for example, a galactic kind of existential creature kind of like thing level. And so I... <laughs> And there's a view that it's as if like Earth is superior. So, so, I'm, oh man, I'm kind of, oh, let me say it like this. Imagine psychology of any human being at any moment in any space and time, any moment in any moment. 
is a room. And once you are aware of the room, you can be aware of where, what else there is. You have to find the edge of a certain ideological wall. I'm speaking in a mystical context here. Because really, either we are electrons hallucinating human life, or reality is as multidimensional as we choose. So you see, it's kind of like three options. Either there is no truth, either there is a truth, we, have, we need to find it, or we have to create the truth. What is the difference between a seeker and a builder, an inventor and a sadhu? The inventor is listening more to to, to the moment than the man who's um, wearing the mask of a soul in a material universe. You know, the concept of soul is not conceptual. I don't know how people are being souls. <laughs> I mean, aside from musicians, I have no idea how people are engaging the idea of soul, you know? <laughs> this belief guys a glass of cold orange juice can bring world peace <laughs> think of it this way uh, a university experiment a university did this kind of social experiment really calculated social experiment they brought a bunch of people they also got in touch with the relatives of those people they asked the relatives what was a real experience that happened like something like you tripped or whatever and the relative says yeah i tripped and i got a scar you know and like you know the person the scientists were gonna like an interview was like okay maybe i'm <laughs> Group of scientists, they take one person, a group of people, and they ask them, do you remember? It's like we talk to your cousin and the cousin's like the actual cousin and they tell they're pretty much lying, the scientists. And they're saying like, uh, your cousin said that um, uh, he fell and he had his, he, his, his arm kind of ripped and you were right there with him by the elevator. They, the scientists get exact details, but the actual event never happened. And they would tell the person, and the person's like, yeah, yeah, I'm actually remembering the details. And most people would agree. And that was a terrifying result. It was terrifying because it means in the blind spots of subjective phenomenology there is fabrication going on so really the scientist is like holy shit it's not about like the experiment it's about where i'm where am i taking the scientific experiment to a reality where human beings are governed by not just their chemical makeup and constitution just their body's chemistry but aside from their body's chemistry how can i tell you it's like It's an irrational society because our emotions make us entertain parallel potentials of the world. You know what that means? That means a person can go in front of another person and they can talk to that person and they can see that person. But in behind, while they're doing that, they can also subjectively be entertaining another parallel line of thought. You know? That means the issue is we're all people are always listening because their ears are working. It's just that what they are hearing, are they hearing what they're listening to? 
And really, the effort of all speech is for the inner eyes to be seen, to be honest. I found it fascinating that there has been in circulation a passage of stories. And it's just incredible to me how a memory <clears throat> is like two moments in one. The, uh, the action of remembrance is by definition, multidimensional. You are somewhere and you're also remembering somewhere else you were. Do you see? It's like multi-local. And uh, we haven't, as a species, I'm saying, I don't care what nation, country, where you are. If you're a creature on this rock, pebble in a light beam, you know, you're good to hear this, that at some point, the sensitivity to the relationship of experience with language, with reality, the mystics, the yogis, they conceived that experience was the cause. That means prior to language, what was there? When in religions they said God said the word, and it's like it all started from a word, from the sound of creation as if like bang, like he, and saw the cosmos appear. <laughs> through, you know, a long process, but I'm saying at some point there was um, um, an intention, literally like the, the pond is settled and a rock is thrown, right? And in the cosmological view, I think this, this is called in philosophy, the cosmological argument of how is design in non-existence? You know, how is existence standing in non-existence? By non-existence, I mean like, you know, regardless of how precious our lives are or are not, you know, there's some human beings living as if their lives are not precious to them. You know, there's some people living as if their lives are too precious for them, so precious that they have even separated them from the world that's actually here. You know, this, the mind, whatever the person listening to this feels the mind is, this mind is animate. Even in Italian, the word anima means soul. So it's as if something that is expressive. Now, it is expressive... In, in a more sophisticated way than anything else in its environment. And I think really technology is a result of man's mind increasing its threshold of curiosity to a point where it's getting, it's as if we, we it's as if like whether man was rejected from the heavens, like the Tower of Babel, Babylon was broken or not, it's like either way, there needs to be an effort. There can be no story without movement. What does that mean? That means if you go into a new environment and you don't participate in that environment, you don't become a part of that environment story, you know? And really how life is that it starts with 
uh, always. It's like it's by nature. Like you're born alone. You know what I mean? Like you, you open your eyes in one body as one being. And it's like the person's presence is the center uh, of gravity of their personality. This is why I say to everybody, be playful with language be, and be even more playful with spirituality because when I say playful, I don't mean don't, not take it seriously, but I mean like before spirituality, study your relationship with language. To some scholars, the dictionary um, is a creator of worlds. <laughs> And I don't know what to say. The lives of human beings are passing by. It's like the sands in the hourglass of existence is every human being that comes and goes. So really, for me, the planet actually seems more like an airport. But it's an airport where the passengers enter the airport once, you know, they fly into another airport and that's it. <laughs> Where does the wind blow next? Person A. Imagine person A is walking on the street. Person A goes up to person B and says to person B, be yourself. <laughs> okay? And person B hears this sentence and many years imagine pass by. And then that memory comes of that interaction and in a strange way, from one person's personal objective universe, there came <clears throat> a subjective reception from another. So what does that mean? That means when I look at you, you you're an object, but when I look at myself, I'm, I appear to be some sort of subject, some sort of ego, some sort of, you know, character in a, in a world of a story. So you see what I mean? When you look out, it is, it is as if the external is observable. But the internal, you're kind of being it. This is why there's no doer. There is, this is why truth never wasn't a horse with a saddle where a certain, like... Our bodies cannot travel through time, but our minds create time. <laughs> do you know? Do you see how badass the mind is? It creates time, guys. <laughs> Anyways, my whole point is that we are influencing each other's lives. Um, uh, a person has many dimensions to acknowledge and the mind has an ability to, to entertain. You can see multiple versions of the same moment. It's kind of like just like how you can put an object and move around it. Often when I give these talks, it's as if the title of the talk is like this, this kind of like strange kind of um, design set on like a designer's table and the designer is wondering about it. You see, it's like I'm telling you, there's, there's something in life that will become so important that the human psychology literally cannot resist itself. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like the same way a person doesn't eat, if a person's emotional reality doesn't go up and down, like they might die. <laughs> they might die inside, you know. 
so so, so it's like <clears throat> i don't know i don't know what it is but one thing has to be considered and i i speak of course um to an audience at least i entertain that i see people as either advanced communicators or pilots of consciousness and uh, these are terms that I've kind of created because I realize if I speak about anything else, it's like people are going to be like, what do you mean? But if I speak about concepts that I've created, then there's more freedom there. So <clears throat> the pilot of consciousness is another way of saying attention navigating manifestation. And the advanced communicator is literally a being, any human being who has realized that the advancement of their communication is their universal sector's expression. So what that means is whether we like each other or not, or not as a species, the advancement of our civilization is like, hey, you know, forget your wars and look at the future, you know. <clears throat> philosophy has to excel and philosophy is kind of like the backup system, uh, especially when a civilization becomes too technological. That means when at any time, any time when things changed more quickly than expected, people start asking questions. So the more chaotic a civilization becomes, the more philosophers it will have. The more philosophers it will have, that is a symptom, believe it or not, of an inefficient civilization. Because there, it's as if we still don't know what the right question is to even look for the answer. <clears throat> So there, there's something important in life that it's, if, if it was just a solo game, you wouldn't need an objective body. You, you wouldn't require a manifest external projection. Of course, it's very hard to speak about existence and speak about a meaning without that meaning uh, being attributed to uh, uh, the communicator's personal truths. Like I, I understand that it's like my eyes have opened to reality in a certain way. So I'm not, obviously I'm not like my voice isn't everything. But what I'm saying is that uh, we are uh, as just like how we look at the stars, the stars are looking at us, you know? So <laughs> <clears throat> the species, if it has a better option, should take it. And that better option, I think, is an evolutionary return to nature, which means some great minds, hopefully, hopefully in the future generations arise, that these great minds are like, okay, they'll probably be the great grandkids of some extremely successful people uh, currently in the world, probably, do you know? But eventually what will happen is that we will pause like a video game the story we're telling ourselves about our civilization and a new collective narrative and ethos tends to arise. And so what it means is for the first time, I mean, it's, it's very easy, like New Year's, you can say New Year's is an event where people all around the world have something in common. They're, they're worshiping time, but it's cool, you know. <laughs> It's like a ritual that every human being can be involved in. And so the ethos of civilization will be a narrative. And it's very hard because, uh, this is what I was going to actually say, that you can't expect, like there was a moment I was walking and I'm like, what if there's a chance I was born 400 years too soon? You know, for example, of course, these are, these are, uh, you know, thoughts that arise, you know, but I wondered, you know, sometimes from the most chaotic movements, the most crystal precision diamonds of order are found. For me, sometimes when uh, I've just accepted the moment and karma has happened, the issue is it's like there's no such thing as good karma or bad karma, but karma is like, like a reflection of your own intention. What that means is you're a creature. The moment you move, it's as if you're setting into motion a psychological framework of value keeping throughout the day, right? <clears throat> In other words, what I'm saying is when two human beings speak, it's as if in each other's eyes, their objective selves are subjective. What that means is truth 
is like a bubble. And I'm trying to think how that helps, how that metaphor helps us, guys. <laughs> I'm trying to think of it this way, guys. If I look at myself in the mirror and for a second I entertained that that was another me, now that another me would still be a subject to me. So regardless of what the world presents, there's always a subjective value extracted from the moment. Really, language is an evocational technology. You know, this is one outcome that is definitely should be up for a philo philosophical debate. That means um, just like uh, how we have in educational systems, and this is unfortunate, but it's the reality, like children skip class and for drug use or whatever. So, so when there's something like this, it's as if some person denying the normality, the vision of the status quo and trying to go outside of it to attain an experience out of what is normal. So I thought, why is this just objective? Why not we have incredible, vast philosophical movements? Because really what it is, is people asking questions enough for them to see things in a, in a way that is new. I don't know how to say it. It's like, and this is a good question. How can an eternal being have a new experience? Well, really, when it goes beyond the language threshold, if a story is needed to explain it, then it can, uh, we are very far away. It's like, if you got to explain how experience is instantly occurring to someone, then it's as if they have not even been aware of how they are. And the mind is, what is it? It's kind of like, believe it or not, biologically, it's kind of like a jar. The brain, the skull is like a jar. Okay, so it's like whether the person uh, eats the right food or the wrong food, you know, the right plant or the wrong plant, it becomes one of those situations where even if the person starts dancing, sometimes I wonder, whoa, if we had somehow technology that could show a dancer's thoughts as they danced, you would see some unique subjective movements. Do you know? As if we, every person in the audience would be like, whoa, look at the dance moves, would look at all the various types of thoughts that are and emotions that are arising as this dancer is dancing. You see, and what it is, is emotion does something to the subjective realm where a lot of sacrifice can be felt. And when I say sacrifice, sacrifice in one view is the ultimate action, but in another view, it is the lowest result. And I'm not talking about like Mayan kind of stuff, guys. I mean, like a person sacrifices their time to go be with somebody else, like that, that level of sacrifice. <laughs> so this can imply something. If two people, person A and B are standing beside each other, they're talking to each other, person A knows it is an object <clears throat> and person B knows it's an object but person B wouldn't know person A is an object unless the per person could touch person B. So what it is is every person's DNA and unique kind of life is like a system of patterns of familiarity. And so what it is, is when we enter new territory, what does the mind do? It either tries to immediately bring up the defenses. Defensive people, what they are, this, uh, sometimes you can say introversion is a sign of a person really having their defense up. Do you know? <clears throat> That's, that means sometimes like shy people should be uh, recruited for the night's watch, you know? <laughs> 
introverts around the world are perfect for the night's watch, you know? Because they have, it's as if they're, it's, it's sometimes fascinating because in various moments in life, there is various like, you know, intensities of psychological performance. Uh, in one moment, a person can be completely like your body's physically moving. Imagine you're a soccer player and you're in that moment where you're about to do a bicycle kick. In that moment, it's like you're not wondering about the meaning of life and truth or something. You're in such the, the objective realm is active in such a way where the subjective realm has simply become the witness. But there can be moments when the body is super still, like in these yogis that would go into caves, that suddenly the subjective realm becomes the movement, the prime movement of the attention goal moves in the subjective realm, and then the body becomes like a witness. So the reason in samadhi, the body, the, the human body of the person in proper samadhi, nothing happens to it because behind their eyes, their body is an attributeless witness. It has switched sides. Okay, and of course, I'm, I'm trying to kind of uh, pave my way, own way in this for it, like cutting branches with a machete. But I'm saying, guys, like... Um, entertain what I say. Of course, Aristotle says it's the sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. That means for the end of your life, you can chill when you hear words because they're ideas that you you can entertain or not entertain. You know? You can say the wealth of the body has become green paper, but you can say the wealth of the mind is simply clarity, clear vision. That is the greatest blessing what a person's eyes in their conscious state, how it moves and navigates. And sometimes you got to realize the environment has an agenda. What that means is if you go sit on an anthill, you know, and you put like a full kind of wedding cake there, what you're going to notice, <laughs> what you're going to notice is that you, the, like as you sit there, as the ants suddenly come out, guess what? The ants have an agenda. Now, can we say like, oh my God, the, the ants have a conspiracy. The ants like, you know, knew I was going to be like, well, it's, it's just, you see it, what I'm saying is there's various systems of movement. So a uh, civilization at its most advanced level will be the integration of not just people's ordered minds, which leads to a common language with people's chaotic dimensions. However, the chaotic dimensions can be translated. So what that means is, um, think about it this way. <clears throat> right now, you are being your future self's memory. <laughs> It's like consciousness is honestly like a flickering candle. When I wake up in the day, it's as if I'm like, for me, believe it or not, guys, this may sound strange, but after some point, it's like this waves of a, uh, the sh like imagine a shore, and then it's like the waves of the water uh, uh, coming and going past the shore. Do you see what I mean? Like after some point, whatever story you give it, whatever kind of emotional way you sculpt the truth of the moment, eventually it's just an activity. Do you see? So all of life in its most simplest, purest way is just nature happening quietly. But man's mind has moved beyond the realms of silence. Do you see? And so some people say it was Adam's Kind of the, the forbidden fruit was taken. But let me tell you what that forbidden fruit I think was or was a metaphor for. It was how the, the, the mistake of man in a Abrahamic traditions as Adam fell from the heaven in some sense was how from silence there came noise. And when there came noise, when the dualistic dimension could be conceived by the intelligence of the human being, infinity was born. Zero, one, two, infinity. Nothing, something, something aware of itself. 
something aware of itself endlessly. Really the evolution of intelligence, if, if we think right now we're individually objective conscious beings, guess what our evolution would be, you know? We see the caterpillar experiencing many legs, walking on the leaf, going into the cocoon, coming out as a butterfly that's flying on it, like in the air, like, whoa, that was a quick life change, you know? And so really it's the inspiration of genetical, like nature's continuity. Some people say that it's like existence is the alien in a realm that seems that the edges are not even visible. It's as if like, well, there is no, it's like, wh why is there space? Language was sparked like fire. Our caveman ancestors, like probably, I mean, honestly, I think fire wasn't, was first from a lightning hitting a tree. And then, I don't know, maybe an ape taking that tree branch and setting a whole like part of the forest on fire. And then all of them could use fire. I don't know. <laughs> It's fascinating to consider that a memory for one person can also be a memory for another. And really what I think is rather than just this internal external, it's kind of like I, I had suggestions of this uh, early on, but really human consciousness and psychology is like a donut. I don't know how to say it like it like there is there is a sort of cyclical full f full complete circular kind of relationship I don't know how to say it The sages would say there is only two things you can do in life And those two things are either you trust the moment or you don't trust the moment. Now, what are these options? That means if you don't trust the moment, that means you have not even given a chance. I have to share this, but uh, it's this quote from the Diamond Sutra that says, keep your mind alive and free without abiding in anywhere or anything. Really, the ultimate question comes down to what do we do with conscious manifestation? What do we do with, uh, does, is there a responsibility that comes with the biological evolutionary position? Or are we just kind of bewildered creatures till the end of time dwelling in our own inner realms?
There's this poet Rumi, he says, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a place. And he's even badass enough to say, I'll meet you there. <laughs> He says, I'll meet you there, and when the soul sits on that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Eventually, there is a state beyond the dualistic kind of value system. That means you for a second realize the power of forgiveness was the erasure. It was a sort of uh, opening up of space, as if when you forgive, forgave the fool, in that moment you freed internal space. You see, people just think they're their body, so they never care about how far their eyes are really actually seeing the world. The fact that we're existing in each other's memories really means that our lives, are, are the creative influence of our lives are connected. They may be not connected directly, but indirectly there is. Do you know that means that moment when I was walking out of the subway, you know, all those people in the subway who saw me and I saw them, you know, just just normal people passing by. It was for a second as if ob my objective existence was in present in the in like all those people's subjective memory, even though it was in their subconscious, you know, but for a second, I found it fascinating, you know. I want to go into a something I call a quote tunnel, guys. It's part of the, like it's a segment in these shows that I kind of bring sometimes. Um, and I want to kind of get into Bushido quotes right now. I don't know why. But uh, Japanese samurai ethics, I feel I need to share something about that. <laughs> Okay. So guys, pretty much I'm going to read you a bunch of quotes from Samurai. <laughs> like actual Samurai in history, okay? <clears throat> Miyamoto Musashi, he says, think lightly of yourself and deeply of the world. He says, observation and perception are two separate things. The eye that observes is stronger. The eye that perceives is weaker. He says, today is victory over yourself of yesterday. Tomorrow is your victory over lesser men. Today is victory over yourself of yesterday. Yeah, so if you get past today, you'll feel like you were victorious in comparison to who you were yesterday. And then tomorrow is your victory over lesser men. Okay, so maybe like a reach for the stars kind of deal here. <laughs> Now, Yamamoto Sunetomo is actually the writer of this, the book of the samurai, which is Hagakure. And um, so the, his quotes are very notable. He says, if you launch without vigor, 
seven out of every 10 of your actions will not reach their target. He says, it is good to face challenges in your youth. He who has never suffered will not, sufficient, will not sufficiently temper his character. Wow, that means so suffering gives you inner management skills. <laughs> Um, another person, this man is a compiler of Zen sayings. He says, Inazo Nitowe. He says, the spiritual aspect of valor is evidenced by composure, the calm presence of mind. Tranquility is courage in, response, in, re, in re, repose. <coughs> He says the discipline of strength instills resistance without complaint and also teaches courtesy. It demands that we not ruin the pleasure, of, pleasure or serenity of others through the expression of our own sadness or pain. He says, the benevolence was considered a sovereign virtue in two senses, sovereign among the multiple attributes of a noble spirit, and sovereign because it is particularly proper for the function of a sovereign. Okay, so... Um, Sorry guys, I'm just trying to dismantle this quote. He says, The benevolence was considered a sovereign virtue in two senses. Sovereign among the multiple attributes of a noble, no, noble spirit. That means kind of like a sort of endless compassion. And he says, and sovereign because it is particularly proper for the function of a sovereign. So that means it, it, it's like it meets the demands of another world. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, Bushido <coughs> Excuse me. Um, anyways, there's um, there's a book called The Path of the Warrior, The Path of the Samurai. And so there's quotes from there that are samurai-like, I guess. He says, when you give advice, you should first discern whether or not the other person is willing to accept it. If you embark on an uncharted path, infinite secrets will appear at the end. Their attitude towards life was, was that of those who always strive to be better and they saw spirituality as the path to achieve greatness. Okay, the quotes became less samurai-like. In Hagakura, the book of the samurai, it says, There is surely nothing other than the single purpose of the present moment. A man's whole life is a succession of moment after moment. There will be nothing else to do and nothing else to pursue. Live being true to the single purpose of the moment. The same book says, There is something to be learned from a rainstorm when meeting with a sudden shower. You try not to get wet and run quickly along the road. But doing such things as passing under the eaves of houses, you still get wet. When you resolve from the beginning, you will not be perplexed, though you will still get the same soaking. This understanding extends to everything. Even if it seems certain that you will lose, retaliate. Neither wisdom nor technique has a place in this. A real man does not think of victory or defeat. He plunges recklessly towards an irrational death. By doing this, you will awaken from your dreams. Okay. So, guys, we got to realize back in the day, they were in a culture of war. Okay. So, like, if they had to kind of speak to the younger generations to raise warriors, so I guess this would be something they would say. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, 
To give a person an opinion, one must first judge well whether that person is of the disposition to receive it or not. Be true to the thought of the moment and avoid distraction. Other than continuing to exert yourself, enter into nothing else, but go to the extent of living single thought by single thought. It says, it is a wretched thing that the young men of today are so contriving and so proud of their material possessions. Men with contriving hearts are lacking in duty. Lacking in duty, they will have no self-respect. It says, it is said that what is called the spirit of an age is something to do which one cannot return. That this spirit gradually dissipates is due to the world's coming to an end. For this reason, for this reason Although one would like to change today's world back to the spirit of 100 years or more ago, it cannot be done. Thus, it is important to make the best out of every generation. Wow. As if when the collective ethos dies, it, the spirit of the advancement of our civilization as a species, when that spirit dies, it's as if the world is ending. And it's kind of saying like, there's going to be a subjective apocalypse. That means you're, the world is going to be so messed up, it doesn't matter what thought you have after some point. Bushido is realized in the presence of death. This means choosing death whenever there is a choice between life and death. There's no other reasoning. Okay. Really, I think, again, take into, culture, take into consideration warfare mindsets back in the day. When one is writing a letter, he should think that the recipient will make it into a hanging scroll. <laughs> If a warrior is not unattached to life and death, he will be of no use whatsoever. The saying that all abilities come from one mind sounds as though it has to do with the sentient matters, to do with sentient matters, but it is in fact a matter of being unattached to life and death. With such non-attachment, one can accomplish any feat. Guys, there, there is an incredible jewel of wisdom in this quote. And just the sentence is, a matter of being unattached to life and death. Can you imagine a way the human psychology is existing where it acknowledges life clearly and it acknowledges that it's temporary and there's death happening all the time? So once chaos and order has been fully confronted, that's when you are unattached to life and death. A glimpse beyond the language threshold, any sort of non-dual experience, any sense that you're not just the contents of your moment, you're your whole moment of being, just being regardless of any ideology, that's, that's, the, that's the jewel. That there is no other being that can that has your eyes when you realize that that's when like uh, you become a uh, some sort of writer you know <laughs> the quotes continue um from hagakura the same book uh, of the samurai it says there's nothing we should be quite so grateful for as the last line of the poem that goes when your own heart asks <clears throat> in the kamigata area they have a sort of tiered lunchbox they use for a single day when flower viewing upon returning they throw them away trampling them underfoot the end is important in all things matters of great concern should be treated lightly master it Master E.T. E.T. Master E.T. Oh my God, that's extraterrestrial. 
<laughs> Master Itei commented, matters of small concern should be treated serious. Yep, we got to try to make sure um, the world is seen before it leaves, you know. It is spiritless to think that you cannot attain to that which you have seen and heard the masters attain. The masters are men. You are also a man. If you think that you will be in fear in doing something, you will be on, the ro on that road very soon. Respect, honesty, courage, rectitude, loyalty, honor, benevolence. That's it. Like, that's the whole sentence, guys. It's like, this man went like beast mode, like, like a machine gun of like wisdom right there. If one is but secure at the foundation, he will not be pained by departure from minor details or affairs that are contrary to ex ex expectation. But in the end, the details of a matter are important. The right and wrong of one's way of doing things are found in trivial matters. <clears throat> if by setting one's heart right every morning and evening, one is able to live as though his body were already dead, he gains freedom in the way. In China, there was once a man who liked pictures of dragons, and in his clothing and furnishings were all designed accordingly. His deep affections for dragons was brought to the attention of the dragon god. And one day a real dragon appeared before his window. It said that he died of fright. He was probably a man who always spoke big words but acted differently when facing the real thing. Very true. Guys, I experienced the moment this year that it was so intense and life-changing. And I felt literally this wind, this like incredible wind. Imagine you're standing on the street, but internally I was feeling this. Like this incredible wind pushing aside every thought my mind has ever entertained. I literally felt like I was, for example, dying in that moment. You know, I felt it was like I could totally see how suddenly a ch lot, lot of stuff was taken away. You know? So really, the real thing, of course, is on an experiential level. The ideas we entertain about reality, these are just battle plans in the bunker of our beliefs until we figure out what to do with all this unknown potential, you know? <clears throat> I'm just going to continue with a bit more of these quotes, guys. Um, sometimes I listen to these talks and, uh, in the future, so I want to make sure I record these. Um, so from the same book of the Samurai, the quotes continue, the quote tunnel continues. It says, sincerity does not only complete the self, it is the means by which all things are completed. As the self is completed, there's human heartedness. As things are completed, there's wisdom. This is the virtue of one's character and the way of joining the internal and external. Thus, when we use this, everything is correct. Although this may be a difficult thing, if one will do it, it can be done. There is nothing that one should suppose cannot be done. No matter if the enemy has thousands of men, there is fulfillment in simply standing them off and being determined to cut them all down, starting from one end. Okay, again, intense battle warfare psychology. You know? <laughs> in the highest level, a man has the look of knowing nothing. No, I don't think it's, it's just the look of knowing nothing. It's the look of at least looking at something that you know you know nothing of, you know. Purity is something that cannot be attained except by pilling effort upon effort. Human life is truly a short affair. It is better to live doing the things that you like. It is foolish to live within this dream of a world seeing unpleasantness and doing only things you do not like. Even if it seems certain that you will lose, retaliate. Of course, we read this. If one has no earnest daily intention, does not consider what it is to be a warrior even in his dreams and lives through the day idly, he can be said to be worthy of punishment. Victory and defeat are matters of the temporary force of circumstances. The way of avoiding shame is different. It is simply in death. 
Do not rely on following the degree of understanding that you have discovered, but simply think this is not enough. And here's the last one, guys. In offering one's opinion, one must first ascertain whether or not the recipient is the right frame of mind to receive uh, counsel, which is a repeat. I think really human beings are left with external movements and internal movements and there's ultimately just a presence of silence inevitably as space in the back of everything that is kind of like it's like intelligence appears spontaneous because it's hovering in no context. It's like you can think about a spiritual experience being a moment where a concept that is defined to, that is identified to a certain context suddenly the context changes so the concept now stands alone and when it stands alone it is no longer a relationship of the same context as if the context is gone as if the person has experienced something that has woken them up you know while they're awake you can wake up of course when you're awake uh but only when you wake up to your subjective realm that's how i'm saying it so anyways, guys, that's for the quote tunnel. Um, a few words before I end off. <clears throat> the idea of the title was for me to simply communicate that psychologists have to begin wondering about this relationship of objectivity and subjectivity and the relationship of all these individual personal truths of 8 billion creatures as if like okay let's see what the most chaotic possibility is and now from the chaotic possibility we wonder about what is the most ordered possibility eventually there comes a sort of parallel way where the mind through the day as much as it can see the light it can see the shadow it's as if like a sort of directorial vision where everything's being uh, taken into attention, you know, the sensitivity of the contrast of various ideological perspectives. Really what it is, is language management. It's language management, but, but this language management is, becomes like an alphabet. So everything, you know, imagine it's like uh, it can also gain momentum and integrative potential rhythmic potential so think of that rock star artist on stage just zoned out think of that like uh, emotional pianist like on an iceberg kind of like like you know internally crying as he's playing piano we are creatures that as we have cared for the subjective realm we have tried to manifest it the body was easy the body was right there. You don't have to do much to prove to yourself that you have a body. It's like the body's right here. Okay. So, but to, in some sense, wonder about the mind, it's like a mystery. <clears throat> it's the mystery of the seer and the seen. Of the observer and that which is observed. And so when this, this archetype naturally is adopted, when you actually care enough to just pause life like a video game and just wonder about it anew. The mind is fascinating and I think whether we know it or not, we are being part of the background of every other human being. And what's really interesting is that like to others, I think that's how a mind appears. Of course, back in the day, minds, they freaked out. So savage animal kind of like behavior. Okay, but now in modern times, we have sort of a sort of linguistic simulation set up as a safety net of regulation. And so it's as if as we have sparked this sub, uh, subject this linguistic simulation as a species, we have in some sense been able to kind of create subjective laws, certain ideas. And so it's only been through communication. And so some people may, for example, hate capitalism, but really capitalism is a manifestation of something that in certain moments of history, it, it kind of evolved language. The fact that people had to trade stuff before money was around. 
they had to barter. So it was like reality was kind of like very fascinating because based on what people wanted, the creature wanted, its interaction was based. Now I, I eventually thought, uh, how can we make a world of geniuses? And I realized, well, two problems. First, we got to see how we define genius in, in a modern landscape. And two, how do we attempt efficiency as 8 billion creatures on a rock? We are not like ants, do you know? I mean, like... Maybe the people in UK are, <laughs> and in Canada, like they are, but like, I don't know how to say it. Like, beyond man made value systems, I think really we got to kind of create a, a, a civilization where, uh, people's inner realities are externalized and they're externalized in enough of a secure creative space where there could be contributing there could be value so that could mean just like how we see in science fiction movies the cities are advanced and the uh um transport systems are moving incredibly quickly so we have to kind of think about that in regards to the inner realm in regards to human beings and their subjective landscapes and it's like what is the value of every human being that is alive and it's kind of strange because unless you communicate it it's just an inner phenomenon as if like you are in your inner museum of your memories you know a museum only you have access to so so the imagination does come across as if like it's 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 phenomenology in a room that we only have access to at the person now <clears throat> it's kind of strange because one has to ask the question could the biology be incredibly sophisticated to deceive itself that it's subjective or one may ask that is did the biology ever exist so it's like I, like we do understand that, you know, before a person is born, the world existed and other people were born. But the thing is, for the personal reality where the personal truths of the person matter, their life began from consciousness day one. So the doctor slapped them on the back as if, welcome to earth, kid. You know? <laughs> Efficiency, efficient vision. These two words will be the uh, champions of humanity. The efficient is the greatest opportunity attempted. And vision is how the moment it, it becomes your world. I don't know how to say it. Like, it becomes kind of poetic. Like, let me see. It's a sort of psychological dissolution into pure experience that is so pure that it has become a, like a glass orb representing the whole field of intelligence's movement, right? So that means the attention liberates itself to full access to the moment by not just keeping, its, uh, keeping itself into, in, in, in an objective context. You see, what I say is like, it doesn't matter what story we tell ourselves, because ultimately the story is, uh, we, it's the attention that directs the story. That means it's like somebody could come and tell you one story, but you could totally look at another story. That is the freedom of mind, you know? There is a lot of freedom to be different, but there isn't a lot of freedom to be same. Oh my God, excuse me guys.
Sorry guys, the speaker had to chug a glass of orange juice. <laughs> Sometimes I feel in these talks, uh, it's a way of me communicating to my future self when like, you know, I don't know, maybe whenever else I get to upload this talk in here. Or, sorry, not upload, but like um, hear this talk. But what I mean is like sometimes I feel free will is its own future architect yet it has to extract the resources the momentum of its life so what it is is imagine a civilization where people didn't have to waste their mind's abilities on uh labor uh just to get enough resources to get by some people will imagine saying like yo we need hardship in life let's keep a lower class of civilization and people are going to be like whoa no 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 because in that lower class of civilization, if that lower class of civilization was given enough resources, maybe a bunch of Albert Einsteins could step out into the world. So the thing is, every human being's mind is a piece to the puzzle of humanity. You know, it's strange, but unless there comes an effort for some sort of collective initiative, it's as if, why are we all here? You know? <laughs> So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, please entertain what I say playfully, of course. Uh, I see these talks as me painting with words more than speaking. But uh... A freedom that never changed. Before freedom of mind, freedom of vision. So before freedom of speech, freedom of mind, before freedom of mind, freedom of vision, before freedom of vision, vision is its own freedom. That's it, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and namaste.